Welcome to the Sigmund Shorts from the Freud Museum. My name is Jamie Brewers and you're joining me in the beautiful gardens of the museum this morning. It was too nice, I couldn't resist. I'm the events manager at the museum, um, but I'm also an art historian. And if you've heard me talking about uh, sort of art in the past, you probably would have heard me talking about surrealism. But my interest first and foremost is the history of Vienna. Now, of course, Vienna is very important for Sigmund Freud. It's where he lived the majority of his life uh, before he came to London in 1938 as a refugee. And he settled at this house here, which is now the Freud Museum. Now, I'm going to talk to you today about a very interesting part of the history of Vienna, and that's the history of its cafe culture. Now, the cafe in Vienna is a very particular institution with very particular decorums and rules, very different if you wanted to go down the street to your local Starbucks. It's not like that at all. The cafe culture in Vienna uh, stems um, all the way back to 1683. And if you think about the geographical location of Vienna, it sits in the center of the continent of Europe. So it's a very strategically um, important position to be in. And the center of the city is, is like a fortress. There are walls all the way around it. And back in 1683, there was a siege of Vienna. There was a battle between the Holy Roman Empire and the Ottoman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire prevailed and the Ottoman army retreated. And when they did, they left their coffee behind. Now, the story goes one of two ways. One story says that uh, a young Polish gentleman named Franz Kolchitsky, um, <clears throat> he brewed the first coffee in Vienna and opened the first coffee house. Uh, but the flavor was quite strong and bitter and and it wasn't uh, familiar, so he sweetened it with milk and honey. The other story is that a young Armenian gentleman named Johannes Diodato opened the first coffee house and he would brew coffee that he knew from his home country of Armenia. Now, either way, from this time, from the 1680s, the culture evolved. In the 18th century, they started to introduce newspapers and cards. So the, co the coffee house became a place where people would gather and spend their leisure time. In the 19th century, however, Napoleon placed a blockade on the continent of Europe, preventing goods from coming in. And one of the things that was affected were uh, coffee beans. And so the price of coffee went up and the, the owners of the establishments had to find new ways to keep customers coming. So at this point, they started to offer things like alcohol and hot meals. So it was, it was evolving. Now, coming to the late 19th century, this was really Freud's time, Sigmund Freud's time um, in, in Vienna. And for this, I'm going to turn to one of Freud's friends, actually, the, the writer, the Austrian writer, Stefan Zweig, who writes beautif beautifully about the place of the coffee house and the institution that it was. He says in his book, The World of Yesterday, <clears throat> you have to know that the Viennese coffee house is an institution of a peculiar kind, not comparable to any other in the world. It is really a sort of democratic club and anyone can join it for the price of a cheap cup of coffee. Every guest in return for that small expenditure can sit there for hours on end, talking, writing, playing cards, receiving post, and above all, reading an unlimited number of newspapers and journals. So what's really interesting is that Spy was basically describing this space that was kind of both public and private. Now, at this time, it became a place where a lot of intellectuals would meet, maybe some uh, like, you might recognize the names, Arthur Schnitzler, Hugo von Hofmannsthal, Karl Krauss, of course, Sigmund Freud, and uh, Peter Altenberg, and Stefan Zweig, and so on. And they would order their coffees. 
It's interesting because we don't know which coffee Sigmund Freud would have. We don't know which coffee he preferred in the mornings, but we do know which coffee, uh, which coffee house he preferred. He would go to the Café Lantmann. And that cafe still stands today in Vienna. Now, there are a lot of rules and regulations about what types of coffee one could order. And for that, I'm going to turn to the Austrian foyettinist who writes beautifully <laughs> about the, the strict social uh, structures that are put in place about what time of day one could consume uh, a coffee. Now, the foyettinist's name is Anton Kuh. Um, this short essay is from a book called The Vienna Coffee House Wits. And his piece is called Melange equals milk plus coffee. And so it goes. The addition is correct. Melange means mixture. And when you mix milk with coffee, you get the drink that's called milk coffee in France, but melange by us. But something must be wrong here. A few days ago, I entered a coffee house at two in the afternoon and blindly ordered a melange. After all, who can keep in mind the intricate schedule for black, white, and mixed coffee? The waiter expressed regrets. After two, I cannot serve it. Why, can't you get a coffee here until three? Yes, black, but a melange only until two. And in the morning? Until 10, you can get a melange. From 10 to one, only milk, since black is out of the question. From one to two, black, milk, and melange. But from two to three, just black. No, you can also have milk, a cup of black and a little glass of milk, but both in the same cup. No, that would be a melange, forbidden. But a person himself can make a melange from black coffee and milk, can't he? That is not our affair. The authorities permit it only exceptionally. Is that so? Then, then bring me a melange. Well, I'm afraid I can't. Just a cup of black and a small container of milk, or perhaps a cup of milk and a small container of black as you wish. Then bring me a black, cup of black and a container of milk. Dearie, a melange for the gentleman at six. I got milk and coffee and made the appetizing mixture. It tastes better when you do it up yourself. Hail the spirit of the law. It distinguishes between sum and summation, between melange and milk coffee. The respected customers are kindly requested themselves to figure up the detour. Then thank God, milk, coffee, and melange are still different things. This miniature picture really belongs under a political rubric. <clears throat> I'm going to end there. Um, I hope you like this little piece about the history of coffee in Vienna. If you're interested in learning more or about hearing more about the Freud Museum, we are actually hosting our very own coffee morning here in the gardens uh, in June. So we hope to be able to see you then. Thanks and, and uh, see you again soon. <laughs>